Hey, it's Jordan with TYT and TYT Politics. I'm out here at uh, Rosebud Camp. It's where the Youth Council, uh, the young protectors and leaders uh, are, are living out here. It's a gorgeous day, probably the nicest I've uh, seen since I've been here. Uh, this is my third time. And I'm here with uh, a young protector who was assaulted uh, by police, as you can see by her broken arm, uh, now twice. So talk to me uh, about the first time uh, you, you were at a prayer service. Uh, what happened the first time you uh, and the police engaged? Um, the police surrounded us, they corralled us, and they grouped us up so they can take us one by one. We had a no surrender line going around some women and children, well, a child who got caught in the mess with us. <coughs> and I tried protecting the child and getting the child out of there. And when I was motioning, another officer came up behind the officer I was talking to, and he bashed, uh, bashed me a couple of times. He was going for my head, but my hand, you know, reacted and got the bol blows of it. And then uh, he s I stepped back, and the cop finally let me take the boy, and I took my friend Leah with me. And they were trying to stop me from taking her, too, but I just kept insisting, and I kept pulling her towards, you know, the outer part of around the cops. And finally, they just let us go. They said, you know, F it. We got, like, 45 more people right here in this group. So they let me take her and the kid, and that was the first time, the first incident. And then the second incident was when they raided sacred grounds, when we were praying also unarmed still and always will and always have been in peace and prayer and they raided our camp they took people out of the sweat the inapi they were during during ceremony they were having sweat and they dragged them out of there charged them with felonies and they dragged all of us out of there arrested a lot of people who were also just praying charged them with felonies and the, one of the officers tried grabbing my wrist and arresting me because he saw that my wrist was already injured enough, so he thought he could grab me and simply pull me back in. But I got out of it, and I took off running, and a lot of rod protectors helped de-arrest me, so I got away. But uh, four other council members that day didn't, and they got arrested. One of our council members was actually in the sweat when they pulled him out in his underwear and made him sit there for an hour and a half after he had got interrupted from sweat. And sweat is a, a sacred uh, straight, sacred ceremony that they're not supposed to be uh, interfering with. Uh, it's very, um, it, you know, it's, uh, desecrating what you're doing. Yeah, it's like interrupting the Pope when he's doing services, you know. That's exactly what it is. And they didn't, they wouldn't go into, you know, the Roman Catholic Church and interrupt services there and pull everybody out and arrest them with felonies. But that's what they did to us that day during sweat. And uh, you said that the second time he saw that your wrist was injured and kind of tried to mangle it up more. Uh, how did he know that your wrist was injured? Were you wearing that? Yeah, I was wearing another splint slash cast that we kind of just made. And then uh, he had been looking down at my wrist and I had stood, I, was, I had been standing in front of a Humvee that was trying to come onto the grounds and I was preventing him from driving forward. So me and another woman, he tried taking the woman, so I pushed her off so he wouldn't arrest her. Then he right away grabbed my hand and twisted it kind of like like you know like he's trying to grab me and a lot of people helped push me push me off of him and I got out of his arm and he tried like grabbing my shirt and everything and pulling me back in but my fellow water protectors helped me de-arrest myself and uh when you look at the way they're treating young women older women uh some of the police officers are women uh did you ever, I mean, I know Native Americans have been treated uh, this way for centuries, but most people are, that are not Native American are just learning about it now. Uh, are you kind of used to this treatment? Uh, have you seen this from your elders have been treated this way by police? Kind of talk to us about uh, whether this was a shock to you or not. Um, in a way it was because I have never faced pr police brutality like physically, but you know, being Native American, you grow up with racism all the time, so it's just a norm thing. We handle it all the time, everywhere we're from, everywhere Native Americans live. Everyone's just racist as shit to us, so, you know, we're, I'm kind of used to it, so I would say I'm so used to it now, so it's not really a big thing, but it's kind of a big thing because it's not a big thing, you know? Like, people are barely finding out, you know, oh, Native Americans are still alive. Like, people legit in college or students and professors think we're dead think that Native Americans don't exist anymore. You look around at this camp. <laughs> In some ways, you guys are kind of numb to it uh, because it's been your whole life. But this latest 
uh, situation, which is escalating, uh, is kind of, you know, reinforce that. Uh, yeah, like, uh, I, I used to look at police officers, you know, despite how racist and everything they were, you know, it was just a norm to us. But now I look at them and I just can't even with police officers now. Like, I kind of get traumatized by them now after that, what happened. And a lot of people do. A lot of people in this camp are now dealing with PTSD because of those incidents and because of this whole pipeline dilemma and stuff, you know. The fact that they've spent over $8 million trying to protect this pipeline, you know, and still ask for another $2 million that the they had granted to them, another $2 million. So it's going to be $10 million they spent trying to put this trying to brutalize Native Americans who were... Who, gra who granted it to them? Um, I want to say the state of North Dakota. So, of course, the governor... What's his name? Dalrymple? Dalrymple. That's a dumb name, too. <laughs> uh, Dalrymple. You know Dalrymple. Uh, and by the way, the governor, uh, Dalrymple, uh, he's such a brave man that when there was a demonstration on his... Uh, right across from his lawn on public property, which is the state capitol, he watched from his window. So, uh, thanks. Thanks, Jack. Thanks, Jack. We saw you run and hide, too, by the way. You couldn't. You're at your house. We're over here protecting and still standing. We didn't run away. This says much, you know, says much about him. So for viewers watching uh, who are very troubled, they've been sharing things on social media, sending in donations. Uh, what, what's the most important thing they should know and what's the most important thing they should do? That the youth are still involved. We started this movement and we're damn well going to end it, you know. We're going to put a stop to this pipeline, whether they like it or not. And we've always been here in prayer and peace and we remain prayerful and peaceful. You know, the youth pray and everything we do, everything we do centered around prayer and peace. You know, we're not violent, we're unarmed and always have been throughout this movement and always will be. And uh, lastly, uh, I think I know the answer, but uh, do these officers, do you ever get badge numbers? Are there any actions being taken? It seems like the wild, wild west here where they could break the law, make up the law, and there's no consequences. That's exactly what's happening, you know. Any white person that has a grudge against Native Americans or is a racist motherfucker is going to come here and put on a uniform just so he can, you know, get away with the... You know, the beatings, the illegal taking of our sacred chinupas, you know, interrupting our ceremonies, you know, everybody, every racist white person in the country is going to run here and get a uniform and get to do it legally. And, you know, they don't wear badge numbers. They don't wear names. They don't wear nothing. You can't identify them unless you have a video of them, you know, actually doing it to you. And even with that, you know, the dapple worker who was shooting at the horses, uh, he actually got off. He didn't get he didn't get killed. He didn't get shot at. He didn't. He was white, and so he got let go. And there's no charges being pressed against him, even though he had an assault rifle and broke through our barricade with his truck and almost mowed down children and almost shot women and children who were right there, you know. And it's ironic that he ran to the water for protection. <laughs> <laughs> well, I shake your hand, but I don't want to hurt you. So uh, thank you for your your bravery and everything you're doing. Yeah, thank you for being here.